All right. First of all, welcome uh, to Arizona Historical Society's Ask the Author series. Tonight, a uh, special treat. We get a roundtable on Arizona sports history uh, with some amazing scholars uh, and talking about their articles uh, that are free to access now on Project Muse. So make sure you check that out and uh, you're going to want to because they are fantastic. And uh, I will give a full introduction of our authors here in just a second. Today, you're, uh, I'm here as your moderator, and my co-moderator is Dr. David Turpey, who is uh, Vice President of Publications and Outreach, and also the editor of the Journal of Arizona History. And my colleague, Janie Adams, who is the History Engagement Coordinator and our tech guru, because I am not. Uh, a couple of reminders. Uh, please use the chat box or the Q&A feature uh, for comments and questions. We encourage you to use that and ask questions and, and comments. Uh, this is why we're here. This event is being recorded, um, so just and it will be available on our YouTube channel uh, later this week. Uh, a link to the recording and survey will be sent out to you so that it's easy access. And if you enjoy this program, please, please consider becoming a member. Uh, at azhs.org backslash membership or forward slash membership. Arizona Historical Society's mission, connecting people through the power of history. And that's part of this Ask the Author series. Arizona Historical Society is a nonprofit organization and state agency established in 1864. Uh, we have four locations uh, for museums, so come and visit us. Uh, especially, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the summer, Flagstaff is especially nice. Part of our mission, again, we collect, preserve, and tell the story of Arizona's past through museum exhibitions, libraries, and archives, historic sites, educational programs, and the Journal of Arizona History. Stay connected, again, become a member, and get all of the good stuff. Uh, sign up for our email list. Follow us on social media. We're available on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, and my favorite, order a license plate. We were just talking about the monsoon, our monsoon license plates. And you can find all of this information at our uh, web uh, site, azhs.org. All right. And again, Arizona Sports History Roundtable is part of the Ask the Author series. And I am uh, pleased to introduce all of our authors and scholars and very happy to do so uh, because they're just amazing. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Heidi Os Osselier, uh, is the author of two books, Winning Their Place, Arizona Women in Politics, 1883 to 1950, from the University of Arizona Press, and Arizona's Deadliest Gunfight, Draft Resistance and Tragedy at the Power Cabin, 1918. University of Oklahoma Press, as well as numerous articles on Arizona history. She has taught at Arizona State University and Maricopa County Community Colleges and is currently the director of the Arizona History Convention. Dr. Frank Whitehead is the graduate program uh, coordinator in the School of International Languages, Literatures, and Cultures and a summer session instructor in history at the University of Arizona. His research focuses primarily on the intertwined history of gender and human-animal relationships in the 19th and 20th century U.S. West, especially within the realms of ranching and rodeo. Alex Nunez is, Nunez is a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of History at the University of Arizona studying U.S. History and Mexican-American Studies. His dissertation, titled Field of Dreamers, Becoming Mexican-American Through the National Pastime, focuses on race, gender, community, and Mexican-American identity formation through participation in baseball. He also serves as the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Admissions for the W.A. Frank Honors College at the University of Arizona. Dr. Zeb Baker is Founding Executive Director of the Honors College at, College at Miami University in Ohio. He holds a Ph.D. in American Studies from Emory University and has published widely on the racial desegregation of college sports. Dr. Andy Doyle holds a doctorate from Emory University, where his studies focused on the history of the American South. He is an associate professor of history at Winthrop University, where he teaches courses in U.S. social and cultural history, Southern history, sports history, and religious history. His research interests focus on the history of sports in the South, and he has published articles in such journals as Southern Cultures, 
the Journal of Sport History, and the International Journal of the History of Sport, as well as several book chapters. At present, he is completing a book manuscript on the social history of Southern college football between the 1880s and World War I for the University of Illinois Press. Dr. Doyle is a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of the History of Sport. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. I know you have other things to do, but I'm really, really pleased that you are sharing your time and your expertise uh, with us and the AHS uh, community. So I am going to hand it over to Dr. David Turpey, who's going to uh, get us started. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And 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 again, let me let me echo Laura and say thank you to all of our, our authors for, for joining us tonight. We're we're thrilled to have you here. Um, so we have we have some questions that we're gonna throw out to the group and um, just feel free to uh, to answer. Um, so let's let's start with the four authors. Uh, can each of you give a short synopsis of your article that was published in the winter 2021 Journal of Arizona History? I don't know if you want me to call out names, if that would make it easier. Heidi, do you want to, you want to get us started? Sure. Um, this was a COVID project, you know, and couldn't get into archives and couldn't find, didn't know what we're doing. Um, I was helping Tom Dublin, who's a well-known women's historian, um, update on his online site of suffrage workers. And we were writing all these little bios and he said, can you do Sally Jacobs? And I thought, oh, I, I knew who she was from when I did my dissertation way back in the 90s on women in Arizona politics. And I thought, I don't think we're going to find anything on this woman, you know, because she just kind of went off in the ether. She was the press secretary for the State Suffrage Association. And then when I went back and looked, and of course, we have different methods of looking into lives today that makes it a lot easier. I came up with all these hits online because she was a journalist, not an athlete, a journalist with the Arizona Republican newspaper back in the 1910s and 20s. And she got was, entered the journalist world as a um, w typical way women did back then. She was a society editor, but baseball was booming and the owner of the Arizona Republic uh, Dwight Hurd said, hey, we need we need women uh, readers. We want to get them involved. And they hired her to start writing sports columns, even though I don't think she knew a whole lot about uh, uh, any kind of sports besides golf and tennis. And as it turned out, she was quite the feminist. She was quite the comedian. And she had a very long run, almost 10 years at the paper, not only as society editor, but commentary. She looked at sports not as its own little world, but she looked at it as part of the greater pop popular culture. And that's what she was an expert at. So I think uh, she brings a very different perspective to sports history at that time, from a, not only from a woman's point of view, but she looked at sports um, as part of a greater scheme to sell people things theater tickets and music and dance crazes and whatnot. And it just fell in that milieu. And that's how she analyzed it for many years. Thank you, Heidi. Um, all right, so we'll just, I'll just go around my, my screen here. And um, Zeb, you wanna tell us about your article? Sure, this, uh, this work was one of about, this is the third of three articles I had planned uh, about, athletic conferences you know, college sports uh, at mid the middle of the 20th century that had uh, membership that was comprised of segregated Southern universities uh, and institutions in other parts of the country that were not legally segregated and how they then navigated the, uh, uh, the participation of African-Americans uh, in those conferences, particularly after World War II. So there was the Missouri Valley Conference and that manifests itself uh, with the Johnny Bright incident uh, when the great Drake uh, halfback Johnny Bright is assaulted by Oklahoma A&M, now Oklahoma State players in their game in Stillwater in 1951. Uh, and it was caught 
It was captured by two Des Moines Register photographers who then won the Pulitzer Prize, went all over the world. And, it, and Drake ends up leaving that conference in large part because they feel that they are no longer in step institutionally with a conference that's largely comprised of segregated Southern universities. In the, the Big Six, which is the forerunner of today's Big 12, they were the only athletic conference in the country that had an actual written rule in their rule book that, that, that forbade African-Americans from, from uh, participating in the conference. And that was largely because the universities of Oklahoma and Missouri imposed that on the, the, the more Great Plains institutions that were, that were in that conference that had allowed African-Americans to participate as both students and student athletes. Uh, so the Border Conference, which is the subject of this article, is really uh, was, an inst was a conference that was comprised of Arizona, Arizona State, what's now Northern Arizona, University of New Mexico, New Mexico State, and then four segregated Texas institutions, Texas Tech, uh, what's now UTEP, uh, West Texas, uh, and, uh, and Hardin-Simmons. And it's the, the, the interplay between Arizona and Arizona State and their desire to see African-Americans have uh, the full measure of competitive rights after World War II that's really the subject of, of, this, of this article, uh, particularly looking at how, as institutions, uh, the leadership of both of those universities uh, understood what their responsibility was to create uh, a, a campus environment that was open and inclusive uh, and that lived up to the values that, that Americans largely believed they had fought to defend in the Second World War, an open, tolerant uh, society that believed in fair play. And the resistance of the Texas institutions, particularly Texas Tech, to allow uh, African-Americans to compete as equals in that conference uh, is then the, the impetus toward Arizona State implementing a policy in 1947 that they would never again play um, a, a, a university inside the conference or outside of the conference that insisted upon the, the racial segregation of the competitors on the field. And so Arizona State never plays Texas Tech in the entire time they're in the border conference together. The University of Arizona attempted to try to, uh, to pacificate uh, the uh, uh, Texas Tech's position, but then finally comes to realize that Texas Tech was never going to move off of their, their devotion to Jim Crow, uh, and then adopts their own policy that, that basically uh, assumes the same position, which is that they refuse to go and play any institution that segregates competitors. And it's the pressure that, that Arizona and Arizona State, by implementing these policies, place on Texas Tech that ultimately allows the conference to open up and allow for African-Americans to play not only at home in Arizona, but also on the road uh, at all four Texas institutions starting in 1951. Great, thank you, Deb. Uh, Alex, you wanna tell us about your article? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, so this article actually started off as an assignment for a grad class and it developed eventually into, into this. And the article is, is titled Switch Hitting Mexican Diaspora Whiteness and Tucson Ense Baseball, 1903 to 1954. And the reference in that title, switch hitting, that's a term in the sport of baseball that describes the ability of a player to hit from both sides of the plate. And that metaphor is sort of constant throughout the article that I wrote. And I had always played baseball growing up. I knew that it was a lot more significant than just a recreational activity. And so that thought has always been with me as I've navigated uh, graduate school and the research that I do. And so when I approached this topic, I was just simply asking myself, why did baseball matter? Did baseball matter uh, to the Mexican American community in Tucson throughout the first half of the 20th century? And what I ended up discovering from this was 
Um, I, I took sort of three different tracks with this. So I was interested in seeing how baseball influenced the development of the identity of the individuals in the two, in Tucson's Mexican American community, their ability to maybe resist exploitation or discrimination, sort of using it as a tool, and then also as a way to overcome other social disparities that they experienced living in Tucson. Um, sort of those three, uh, the three results that, that I found based on those questions. Um, baseball was a way for two Mexican Americans in Tucson to really start to develop a sort of uh, diasporic identity. And so uh, players uh, that played on teams in Tucson had the opportunity in many contexts to compete against teams in nearby towns who had similar experiences. And so that commonality became a source of solidarity in a lot of instances. And we all know that baseball sort of is regarded as the, the national pastime. And so that was something that was true to its brand back then as well. And so baseball also became a way for participants to sort of perform their Americanness, to, to feel more American especially in a lot of situations in which they were denied that feeling uh, with their peers and their neighbors. And then finally, the sort of the idea of fluidity is, is, is common throughout. So baseball allowed participants to sort of explore the ins and outs, not just of their Mexican identity and playing with each other, but also sort of the ability to transgress those boundaries that existed socially between themselves and other anglo Tucsonans. Um, being successful was a way to demonstrate fitness uh, and belonging in those areas. I specifically looked at uh, the development of um, neighborhood baseball fields sort of as a, as a spatial uh, concept and in, in bridging together segregated spaces. Um, the uh, experiences of railroad workers for the Southern Pacific Railroad who formed their own company teams and became a space sort of to resist uh, not only workplace exploitation, but also um, the denial of opportunity uh, in, in the workplace. And then the, the development in the 1930s of the Arizona Texas League, which was a semi-professional league, that really helped establish those diasporic connections with neighboring teams from neighboring towns all across the Southwest. All right, thank you, Alex. Uh, and last but not least, Frank, why don't you tell us about uh, your article? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, so this article, the roots of this article uh, kind of come from the same roots as uh, my dissertation, which focused more broadly on women in animal history and, uh, and rodeo history. And um, as I started doing research into these women rodeo contestants, of the, especially the 1920s and 30s, um, I really became enthralled in the, this uh, Fox Hastings, the subject of my article, uh, mostly because a lot of these uh, recollections of her from her contemporaries uh, really did not match uh, the description of her in a lot of the newspapers and, and periodicals of the time. They were The description of her was quite different between the two sources, so um, I really was interested in, in why that was. Um, so, I mean, just as an introduction, so Fox Hastings was a rodeo cowgirl. She started as a trick rider and a bronc rider in Wild West shows, um, but she really made a name for herself as a bulldogger or a steer wrestler uh, throughout the 1920s and 30s. Um, she performed at rodeos throughout the country um, and became almost a household name nationally, but she was especially popular in Tucson for her performances at the Tucson Rodeo, and she eventually, uh, with her second husband, uh, settled down in the Tucson area. She loved the area so much. Um, so in the article, I try to use Fox as a case study or kind of a jumping off point to look into these strategies that women rodeo contestants at that time used to really claim and maintain a space for themselves in the rodeo arena. Um, but even though Fox and her, uh, her fellow rodeo cowgirls were popular with spectators, you know, there were a lot of questions and concerns by 
uh, rodeo cowboys, rodeo producers, and some in the press who uh, were concerned about women performing these you know, dangerous uh, masculine feats in the arena. So my article looks at the ways that Fox and, and her uh, contemporary cowgirls constructed these entirely separate uh, feminine identities outside of the arena uh, to sort of calm these concerns and how they emphasize their physical appearance, how they dressed, um, and especially their more feminine role uh, in their household as a mother, or as a wife, to try and maintain this space in an otherwise uh, masculine sport like rodeo. So, uh, but in my article, I also show how, you know, while this, this strategy of separate identities uh, succeeded for a while, uh, it ultimately led to new concerns that instead of the arena masculinizing these cowgirls, the cowgirls were effectively feminizing the arena. And that ultimately contributed to the, the near elimination of women from mainstream rodeos by the mid 1930s. All right, great. Thank you, Frank. And, and thanks to all of you. And, and now I'll hand it over to Laura. Uh, this question is uh, for Andy. Uh, as the guest editor for this special issue of the Journal of Arizona History, can you tell us what it was, uh, what you liked about this uh, special issue and the work uh, of the authors here? What didn't I like? <laughs> I mean, it, it, well, I, I was. I was very impressed. I mean, it was uniformly good quality. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, um, you know, Putting the two football articles in in the same bucket, kind of, I think they told a very good story about the border conference, and um, you know the um, um, just the origins of the border conference and looking at how the Southwest had become kind of a dumping ground for tramp athletes and academically underqualified, unqualified athletes to come play out there when they couldn't get a gig anywhere else in the country. And, you know, you see this and in the, the relative development of the Southwest to the rest of the country that, um, you know, you see conferences spring up in the 1890s, basically, um, in other parts of the country, 1890s and the aughts, to try to put an end to this. The NCAA didn't exist. And, you um, so, you know, I think that article does that very well. And um, just explaining the dynamics of the conference, economic dynamics, geographically, Western distances that are, you know, still hard for me as an Easterner to get my mind around in a lot of ways. So, um, um, so yeah, all of those, but of course the race issue was the critical issue, which, uh, you know, and, and both of you touched on, but, uh, and dealt into, but the, that bifurcation between Texas with, you know, holding the line and white supremacy and, you know, what Zeb, what you were mentioning, World War II with this sea change in racial attitudes, the decline of scientific racism, which had already been, you know, being chipped away at, um, you know, in the academic and intellectual worlds. But that really brought it home to everyone that if the logical endpoint of scientific racism is, well, gee, you know, mass murder, then, um, and it really forced a lot of ordinary Americans to confront this and Arizonans who had already been, you know, moving in that direction in the 1930s said, okay, enough of this. And as you pointed out, Arizona State moving further and faster, but then the University of Arizona finally coming to the same conclusion leading ultimately to the demise of the border conference. And, you know, Heidi, your article and, you know, the Fox Hastings, I mean, and they were both gems. And looking at these female pioneers and boy, have I read my share and then some of, um, 
of uh, articles from that era. And Lord, sports journalism, everything was epic. It was the best. It was the, oh man, this is the greatest game ever. And until next week, right? So, and, and this kind of mythologization of athletes. And Sally Jacobs with this kind of tongue in cheek, you know, well, I'm just uh, kind of a dumb woman here. I don't really know sports all that well, but, and her message is getting across. Heidi, do you know, is there any way of telling, you know, what proportion of her readership, you know, what the gender breakdown of her readership was? No, I, I yeah. looked into that a little bit and, you know, it just, they didn't keep track of things back in the 1910s sure. and 20s uh, like we do today. Um, it, it, you know, what was funny about reading about her was that even advertisers would start mimicking her style in their ads that they placed in the Republic. There's nothing that a publisher likes more than to have their editorial commentary being copied by their advertisers. That means they're, they're getting through somehow. And I think that was for me when I saw that ad that uh, we talked about her and, and made fun of her um, in her own style. I thought, nah, that, that woman, she had it nailed. She, <laughs> she knew how to make fun of herself and kind of diffuse the whole feminist message she was trying to project, you know, trying to radically change how we view women athletes by allowing them to actually wear a bathing suit instead of a long woolen dress that would have drowned them and taken them to the bottom of the pool and doing it in a hysterical fashion that, uh, you know, people had to laugh at even if it, she was they were the the victims of Sally Jacob. And I think that was her power, her superpower. Right. And Frank, uh, with Fox Hastings, I don't know, there were there were just so many good things about it. And the, um, you know, both her toughness and her ability to compete in a sport that still just amazes me that people do this. Um, <laughs> and it's a... Oh, gosh. And you mentioned there that how many young girls growing up in the ranching industry in the West on family ranches and how many young girls who had these kinds of skills who really, you know, develop this and yet kind of, well, no, once you hit puberty, once you're a lady, then, uh, well, no, not so much anymore. Right and not in public. All right, so um, I think you did that very well. And I, I guess also you mentioned unionization and um, and just the economic impact of the depression and the women laid off first policy. But um, you know unions were very good at promoting class interests, and of course they, by the '30s, were very good at cutting across ethnic lines. But lines of race and gender in labor unions generally remain pretty rigid. Did you? I, I know you mentioned that. Can, can you tell us anything more about uh, about that phenomenon? Yeah, um, and that's something that I'd really like to look into more uh, in future research, but from what I've seen so far, um, there, especially with the, the Rodeo Cowboys Union that uh, really formed out of nowhere in the 1930s, um, it, it, there really was no way of uh, separating this idea that rodeo is an inherently masculine sport uh, from the, their you know, intense desire to unionize and, and, and kind of push back against these rodeo producers. So when they, when they all came together and formed their union in the 1930s, it was almost, uh, uh, you know, a, a foregone conclusion that women would be necessarily excluded from that just because of this prevailing view that by then uh, women were just feminizing the sport too much. This needs to be a masculine event um, and, and so this union of rodeo contestants necessarily must be fully male. 
And Alex, I, you know, your article, and you mentioned, you know, baseball is the national pastime. And good Lord. I, I mean, it was baseball. It was 12 months a year. It was baseball season. Then it was a hot stove, and hot stove just lasted and all winter. Trades might happen, might not. You know, <laughs> stay tuned. And um, and baseball is so bred into American identity in a way that you know my students today just have no conception of. But looking at baseball the way you did and grounding it in a particular time, place, and community. And I, I'm interested, I've done some research and a student of mine did in um, community teams and semi-pro company teams in the South. And I know that was just a really big thing. And um, I know you mentioned the Union Pacific and things like this. So this is, you know, minor league baseball certainly you know, it's it's major league as far as cities like Tucson went, but um, but the the grassroots baseball, and I think you you emphasize that well. And um, and anyway, is there anything you want to say to amplify your discussion of that? No, I'll I'll just add that the Mexican American workers for Southern Pacific Railroad forming baseball teams was certainly not unique to Southern Pacific Railroad workers. Mm -hmm. um, that same phenomenon's happened in the sugar beet farms in Greeley, Colorado. There are baseball teams in the citrus groves in Southern California. So it it is something that became a source of refuge in some way to several different working communities of Mexican Americans throughout the Southwest and they eventually became such a big deal that that actual recreational activity became a part of their identity. Uh, you know, they would have whole days on Sundays where it's not just a baseball game, it's cultural celebrations, it's families coming out, it's, it's these groups that otherwise are working long hours every day, every week, with not a lot of time off, living off in very in, in very isolated areas. So baseball really became a vehicle for that kind of solidarity in action. Yeah, my, my own research and my students' research um, about um, the failure of the, <clears throat> the Negro American League, which was primarily Southern. And he looked at Atlanta and they really had a very, very hard time competing with local community teams and uh, semi-pro and industrial teams that you're going to watch better quality players, you know, playing for, you know, the Birmingham Barons or the Black Crackers. Yes, there was such a team in Atlanta, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but um, the Atlanta Crackers were the white team. So, um, but they had a hard time out, you know, drawing people away from these uh, these teams that were more deeply rooted in the community. And I think your work doing that with the Mayacano community in Tucson, I think, you know, just adds to, adds another dimension to what we already understand. Thank you. I could listen to you guys all day, but anyways, uh, David, do you want to take over? Yeah, let me uh, let me throw another question out to the group, and this is this is for this is for everyone. So um, feel free to jump in. Uh, today, there is a lot of controversy around sports, especially regarding issues of race, gender, and activism. How to how do today's controversies compare to the controversies and issues that you all wrote about in this issue? I can take a stab at that question. So um, I mentioned earlier baseball sort of being branded as the national pastime, but, but with that sort of descriptor comes a very specific image of what baseball is, what baseball players look like, and sort of the tone of the sport. 
Back when it became institutionalized in the mid 1800s, there was an idea that baseball was going to be this Victorian game played by gentlemen, very honorable, very so a, a, a sort of a set of a, a decorum uh, with it. And a certain type of player can make that happen. Not everyone could uphold those standards of, of the sport. And with the article that, that I wrote, um, that was that was essentially the uh, underlying reason for the exclusion of lots of players of color. It wasn't it because of the, the perceived ability in a lot of instances um, or, or things like that? It was it was the tarnish the tarnishing of a sport that has this specific brand to it. Um, I think we see echoes of that sort of philosophy in a lot of current day baseball discourse. Um, especially with younger Latino players. I'm thinking of players, if, if you know baseball, like Fernando Tatis Jr., uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Um, and a, a lot of the styles of Latino players are much more flamboyant and emotional and energetic than, than, what's, than what a lot of sort of more traditional baseball fans are used to. And you hear that discourse now with things like, quote, playing the game the right way, uh, there are fans maybe who don't appreciate backflips or overzealous celebrations. And when that discourse happens about players playing the game the right way or the wrong way, I think that is rooted in sort of that philosophy of the national pastime, having a certain brand and image attached to it. So I think that these historical arguments that all of us look at, I don't think they completely go away. I think they sort of get recycled and reconfigured to fit modern contexts. I don't know. The bat flip has become pretty ubiquitous, though. <laughs> I think in my article, the, you know, I'm looking really at how universities dealt with issues of race and we all of us who are working on college campuses today particularly those of us who are in positions of leadership are well aware that we're in the midst of a generational reckoning on issues of 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 race and equity um and that certainly began in 2020 uh or, or became amplified in 2020 and it is and it continues to reverberate even to today and i think that uh, for students uh, and student leaders on those campuses in, in Tempe and, and Tucson, um, what they were essentially wanting after World War II was uh, a similar kind of reckoning uh, with issues of race. And again, the kind of reckoning that would allow for the university to live up to the values that they all believed um, that, they, that a lot of the a lot of these students were were veterans of World War II and to start with, uh, and a lot of them believe that their institutions of higher learning that they had come back to take advantage of with the GI Bill should exemplify the kinds of values that they had gone overseas to fight to defend. Uh, and you see veterans groups uh, on these campuses really trying to, to force the issue of Black participation uh, in Arizona State and and, and U of A sports. And, uh, you know, Arizona State was led by someone uh, who was much more forward-looking person named Grady, Grady Gamage. Uh, and uh, Gamage, a native Southerner, I might add, uh, was far, far further ahead than nearly anybody else in higher education in the state of Arizona at this period of time uh, in terms of embracing Black participation uh, in the classroom and beyond, um, and it's a it is a um, it is an interesting phenomenon that a native white Southerner born in Jim Crow Arkansas uh, is the one who then pushes the issue of of desegregating uh, this conference and desegregating sports at Arizona State. Um, and uh, I actually interviewed Grady Gamage Jr., who is a faculty member there in the law school at at Arizona State, and he, I said, how do you reconcile these, these things about your, your father's uh, record? And he goes, I, I really can't. 
and I can't insofar as I don't know to what extent his, uh, his Southern identity ever really played out because he came out to Arizona so early in his life uh, and, and really sort of viewed his own life as a sort of opportunity to start over. And I uh, and to claim an identity all his own. And it kind of gets back to what Andy was talking about with tramp athletes. In some ways, these were tramp educators who could just kind of reinvent themselves. Um, and I I think that in, in many ways I see resonances of the moment in which we're working right now on college campuses in a lot of what the students and student leaders were expecting of their universities. And those those who led those those uh, leaders who led those institutions because they wanted they wanted better they wanted their institution to stand for what they felt was the, the bedrock principles of a democratic society, and they were not willing to accept anything less than the integration of of sports there in Tempe and Tucson. I think when I was you know, looking at Sally Jacobs and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, we could talk about the women's soccer team having to fight to get equal pay and all the battles that have gone on uh, on the courts and, and off the courts with women. I, she lived in a time when society was trying to control every aspect of a woman's life, how she could dress, because at that time she could be arrested if her skirt was too short or she was wearing the wrong kind of bathing suit at the pool. Um, she, they were being told that they should not be, be driving cars because that wasn't very ladylike and they should be passengers. Um, her favorite sport, by the way, was auto racing and she just loved to go driving uh, with professional racers around the track or on, on road races, but she also <laughs> loved to drive her own car and often did so into a ditch because she was driving too fast, according to her colleagues at the newspaper. So she was fighting just to get in the game. Uh, and so that, and that would not happen for many, many years, obviously for so many ath women athletes, but I think for her, that um, opening the door so that a woman could at least wear athletic wear, do at attend uh, events as a professional athlete was a big deal. And I think that's why women's uh, progress in sports has been so, so slow uh, in, in the grand scheme of things is they couldn't even get in the door. Yeah. Heidi, you mentioned the uh, lawsuit with the U.S. women's soccer team, and I'm also thinking about, you know, recent controversies with the NCAA's lack of comparable investment in women's sports compared to men's, and uh, I mean, you see repeatedly that women's sports can be and often are more popular than men's sports, but uh, they're often offered fewer opportunities to perform or uh, less pay or when uh, or worse conditions to to perform in, um, you know, you know, and to tie it to to my article with rodeo specifically, there's been a huge push with just within the last few years uh, to get more inclusion of women's events in mainstream rodeos, um, especially breakaway roping, which is just like cap roping, except uh, the cowgirl doesn't have to get off her horse; the rope just breaks away from the horse after she catches, um, and women have had a lot of success in getting uh, events like breakaway roping into mainstream rodeos recently, but there's still been a lot of pushback. It's still excluded from the national finals rodeo. Um, it's not included in the, the main season ending championship rodeo. So, um, and so there's, you should continue to see this pushback even to this day that, you know, the roots are way back in the 1920s and 30s where producers and higher ups in the in professional rodeo association um, just refuse to include women's events, you know, breakaway roping, much less, you know, more dangerous events like bronc riding. So there's still a lot of work to do as far as that goes. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, yeah, there's a, I, I see a lot of relevance in, in, in the work that all of you did. So uh, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts on that. And Laura, do you want to take the next question? Yep. 
Yeah, I think this question really leads into what we were all just talking about is uh, when we talk, when we think about breaking barriers in sports, we tend to think of big national names like Jackie Robinson, Jim Brown, Billie Jean King, Arthur Ashe. Uh, yet Frank and Heidi, your articles examined women who broke barriers in rodeo and sports writing here in Arizona, while Zeb and Alex, your articles examined the African-Americans and Mexican-Americans who fought for the right to play the games they loved in the state. All of the people you write about are largely unheralded and, and certainly not household names today. Uh, why is it important to expand the story beyond those big names like Jackie Robinson and, and Billie Jean King? They didn't get to the top by themselves. They had other people before, and you know, during their careers. I mean, that's the obvious answer, right? That the, they had people before them banging on the door to let them in. And I think when you, I think we all know we we taught for years. If you teach about civil rights or any kind of movement, um, there are there's a lot of grassroots activity going on to allow one or two of those marquee stars to make it to the the headlines and it, it's never done by themselves great point absolutely i i really appreciated the fact that i've come to write about community sports now instead of just focusing on the professionals because i think it shows that sports can matter for everybody you don't have to be the best at your sport or at your game to have an impact through the sport. And I think it also shows that your everyday experiences can be significant if they're looked at in the right context or through the right lens. And I think that's why I really appreciate studying things like this is because sports can almost be sort of a, a gateway, not just to understand uh, why everyday experiences through sport are significant, but to understand these other sort of social experiences that occur through them. Um, and so I think expanding research and growing historiography at the community level or through studying individuals who are not household names, um, I think it shows that there is significance in, in many other places than just those who make it to the big leagues or make big bucks playing sports. Yeah, uh, along the same lines, I would say it, it, it makes a big difference and it's really important to tell these lesser known stories uh, for uh, activism reasons. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot easier to envision a larger role for, uh, for instance, for cowgirls in mainstream rodeo or uh, you know, when you're aware of stories like Fox Hastings or it's easier to envision um, uh, more women reporters in locker rooms when you know about Sally Jacobs. So, I mean, these otherwise, you know, unheralded stories like these can help expand future possibilities um, for marginalized groups that, you know, by revealing the possibilities that have existed in the past. And also for me, I mean, uh, this is again, uh, identifying and naming uh, student athletes, uh, and particularly uh, Black student athletes at these institutions that have largely gone ignored or underappreciated. And it's, it's naming that, uh, that participation. It's like, like Alex was just saying, that it, 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 is, it is understanding that, that all, the, the, the breadth of participation is about a lot more uh, than, than just the name grabbing athlete in the uh, in the newspaper on Sunday morning. Uh, it's it's uh, you know I, I think about one particular athlete I wrote about uh, Morris and Warren. Uh, I mean he was he came back from World War II had been in in Patton's Third Army comes back plays football at Arizona State with uh, his brother in law ends up becoming one of the major educators in the Phoenix area was vice vice mayor of Phoenix um, was, you know, his son then goes on and becomes one of the, the first or maybe one of the first black football players at Stanford. And his son is now Kevin Warren, the commissioner of the Big Ten, uh, and probably the most, arguably the most powerful man in college sports, especially given the 
billion dollar TV deal they just signed with <laughs> Fox, NBC, and CBS, and with their coup of getting USC and UCLA to join the Big Ten. Uh, and it, it's it's interesting that here is here is a black man who is the most powerful man in college sports. His father uh, was someone who was told that he could not travel with his college team uh, to go play in El Paso. Uh, and the, continent, the, the continuum ex of experience there from exclusion and now being right at the center of, of the sport, uh, I think is a, is a story worth telling. And it's not, that, that's a story that is an arc of, of participation that you, you can't deny or ignore. Anybody else have anything to add or I don't want to cut anybody off. No. <laughs> All right, uh, David, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Laura. Um, well, we're getting we're getting short on time. Um, so let me just throw a question out that, that Laura and I like to, to ask of our of our authors. Um, it's sort of a softball question. Pardon the pun. Um, what were some of your most uh, interesting and important sources that you uh, that you found and that you used for for your article? Well, this built for me on on research in two hundred fifty different archives nationwide, and so when you talk about the sourcing of of, of sport history, uh, for me, looking at how universities made decisions around their athletic departments. Uh, it's been very important for me to go back and, and understand each institution as it's on its own merits and then how those institutions related to one another. And uh, for this article, um, not only the University Archives at Arizona State and the University of Arizona, um, but, uh, but the Southwest collections at, uh, at Texas Tech, that's really where uh, the, the best uh, treasure trove of material relating to the border conferences at, uh, and uh, that that was uh, a very interesting week spent in Lubbock back in 2015. Uh, it was about 115 each day I was there too, so air conditioning uh, was very very helpful there in the archive. So my my story was the opposite end of the spectrum for research because there's not much on the topic. Um, there are no papers um, from Salik Jacobs, uh, no, nothing left behind. Um, I did a real deep dive and there was nothing there. Her two sons, she died very young and her two sons um, didn't leave behind, uh, didn't, didn't have children. So um, it was mostly just her words, her writing and uh, a distant relative that could fill in some of her biographical background. So that's really, it's purely Sally in that story uh, with a little bit of secondary sources of other women sports writers at the time. But since there were only a few do dozen in the country, there's not, there wasn't a lot to compare her with. One of my favorite sources that I found was um, basically was, was uh, magazine publications. Um, this was a uh, mutualista called the Alianza Hispano-Americana. And um, it, was a, it was a mutual aid society uh, founded in Tucson and um, with sort of the objective of uh, advocating for Mexican-American communities. And um, they published a lot of stories about um, organizational sporting teams, uh, basketball, baseball, other sports, um, and encourage especially young people to get involved in sports, whether it was through the Alianza or through other parts of the community. And they specifically referenced sort of the um, ability to uh, have uh, uh, gain values, uh, uh, morality and principle and and uh, you know, sportsmanship and, and, and cooperation and, and good health. Uh, and, and those were obviously characteristics that maybe might be associated with things like the, the brand of baseball and, and how to sort of perform that Americanness a little bit more. So it was really interesting to see sort of that explicit sort of 
justification of mutual aid societies and advocating for participation in sport because they believe that it did accomplish those ends uh, as a way to better uh, community members. Uh, my favorite source uh, was from a, a recollection of Fox Stations from a bronc writer named Don Bell, who uh, traveled with Fox and, and both of her husbands a lot. And after he retired, he sat down and wrote a bunch of recollections of people that he traveled with. Um, and, and especially Fox Hastings. And uh, he, I wish I could have included everything that he said because it, it's all just so uh, pretty surprising and, and interesting. But uh, in, in interest of space, I, I only included a, a couple sentences from him. But uh, the sentence I included was, uh, he said, I knew, he's talking about Fox. He said, I knew that Hussey and she was the meanest dame ever. She chewed tobacco. The tobacco juice was on her chin, just the same as her hubby. And when you read that and, and his other descriptions of her, you know, throwing men all over the dance floor and, and scaring other women away from parties because she was so intimidating and uh, the, the, the sort of meanness that she would have towards steers when she was wrestling them. And then you, you contrast that with these, these interviews that Fox would do with, the, with uh, reporters about like, yeah, I, I love to go home and bake at Thanksgiving and bake a nice turkey. And I always make sure I'm wearing makeup around my husband. And, you know, it's just so fascinating, you know, uh, reading contrasts like that. That's a great coat, by the way. I love it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Andy, anything that you wanted to add? I know you didn't write an article on this issue, but is there uh, any, anything uh, you'd like to add? Oh, I don't know. I think I'll keep my mouth shut this time other than just to <laughs> congratulate the authors. And um, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure reading your work. Well, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to make sure uh, there was actually two people that asked a question, one in chat and one in, in the question and answer. So I wanted to get it out uh, to, for, it's actually for Heidi so that we could, uh, everybody could hear about it. Um, Scott wants to know, was Jacobs the first female sports columnist in the United States? She was not. There were several before her, Ella Young and Ina, you know, Ella Black and Ina Young, a few others. But I think she was one of the early. It's hard to tell. There's so many newspapers in the country, but and most of them um, didn't last more than a season or so. They wrote for a uh, 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 you know, a few games, uh, a lot of more like her society, the editors writing for, to induce a female audience to go out to the ball games or oh, she wrote about water polo and all sorts of other crazy sports that they were trying to uh, promote. So, you know, she was not, I, I, I'm pretty sure I couldn't find anyone else in Arizona, uh, probably one of the few in the Southwest, but then we didn't have a lot of sports teams back then, in fact, um, she covered the first professional team in the state, um, the Phoenix Senators baseball team, when they debuted in 1915 and lasted less than two months because nobody likes to go to a baseball game in the middle afternoon when it's 115 outside. <laughs> they folded on July 4th weekend for good reasons. Wow. <laughs> Totally understand that. Um, <laughs> and that's why we didn't have professional baseball in this state until they figured out how to put a dome on things, right? <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's 7.59. So um, I, I, I do want to say um, it's kind of interesting that we that we were talking about this because uh, Arizona Heritage Center in, in Tempe is actually working on um, a, an exhibit uh, rebuilding home plate baseball in Arizona's Japanese American incarceration camps. Uh, and it explores how baseball was a means of enduring and escaping prison for Japanese and Japanese Americans incar incarcerated in Arizona's Gila River and posting internment camps from 1942 to 1945. Uh, and I think that is a good example. It's opening next year, by the way, uh, early next year. But I think that's a, a good example of how sports can 
it's not just sports. It's not just entertainment. It's not just recreation, right? It means so much more uh, to communities, to people, you know, across uh, class and gender and race and everything that it can tell us something about society uh, as a whole. And uh, so that's why I think this panels like this and articles like like you all wrote are, are so absolutely important. Uh, so I want to thank you for for taking part in this special issue and, and 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 spreading some of this great information david anything to to tie up uh no i'll just i'll just echo that laura yeah thanks thanks to all of you i, I thought it was an, an amazing special issue and I'm, I'm really proud of it and and uh was was thrilled to work with work with all of you